A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and we are recording this on April 7th, 2021. And our guest today is a criminal defense attorney from New York, Lance Clark, who is a partner at Hamilton Clark. Your offices are on Wall Street. Very impressive. (laughs) Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, uh, we're we're really excited. You know, we we tend to have a lot of West Coast guests just simply because uh, we originate from the West Coast. So we're thrilled to be broadening our horizons to New York City. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about your expertise, only because you're new to sure. the program, and we're thrilled to have you. I understand that you started as a legal aid society attorney early in your career. And for those of you who don't understand, the Legal Aid Society of New York is one of like the oldest law firms. Ever. It's 145 years old, founded in 1876, and basically it's to give legal services to those who don't have the money to pay for it. Yes, that, that's correct. You know, I spent eight years at the Legal Aid Society. I think when I was there, I may have represented close to over 4,000 people during that time. I, I probably represented about 5,000 people in my, uh, in my lifetime. Uh, but the vast majority of those people was at the Legal Aid Society where, you know, you get the best instruction, the best experience. You get right in the fire pit, but you're not wading through the fire alone. You know, you were blessed to have some of the best supervisors that have been doing this for years. And when you're practicing at the Legal Aid Society, there's not a case or a fat pattern that you have not seen. You know, and when you're representing, you know, clients in New York City, which is a heavily dense you know, neighborhood, neighborhood, right? City, right? It's this whole city. <laughs> right. you, get every, you, you get everything from the white collar offenses to the jumping the turnstile to the more, you know, violent offenses that you'll see on the news. I also love the fact that at the Legal Aid Society, which is so important because we talk about this a lot here, there is a huge department that focuses on the protection of children, defending and representing children in court, which, you know, so many of our cases, the children are victims. And it's so important to know that children get their own representation in a lot of these cases. That's very important because, you know, the child is innocent and you know the child is sometimes thrown into a situation where they don't want to point fingers at the mother or the father or the friends. And what the legal aid society does, and, and the courts have these systems as well, where they provide a guardian ad litem to provide assistance for the child. And their whole purpose is to do what's in the best interest of the child, not the parent, not, you know, the accused, but for the child. And I think that's very important because when you're able to protect people who cannot protect themselves, that's an admirable and, and you know notable thing, I think. Absolutely. Well, we're so glad you're here. We can't wait to hear your insight. We have some crazy cases, as we usually do. But I have to say this week, yeah, there <laughs> we got one that's like off the charts. We have a man in Florida who allegedly murdered his girlfriend and then placed the gun in her hand to make it look like a suicide, those cases can be really tricky. Is it murder? Is it suicide? But first, a North Carolina paramedic who is awaiting trial for allegedly murdering his wife by poisoning her with eye drops has just been charged with setting an airborne helicopter on fire. Okay, because the murder case against him isn't crazy enough. We have to add this helicopter fire. (laughs) Okay? You just can't make this stuff up. And if you did, no one would believe it. No one would believe this, Lance. All right. So because the suspect here, 35-year-old Joshua Hunsucker, is accused of two separate crimes that do not appear to be related because the details are so bizarre and a little confusing, I think I'm going to tell you this case chronologically as things were unfolding, not as things have been charged, because otherwise Mm -hmm. we're going to get lost between the two cases. Okay, let us start with the couple at the center of the murder case. Joshua and Stacy Hunsucker were high school sweethearts living in Mount Holly, North Carolina, married for eight years, two kids. In 2015, Stacy gets a pacemaker 
implanted in her heart. She was suffering from different forms of heart failure. She had had a heart attack. And so Stacy was really young. Let's keep in mind she was in her late 20s, early 30s when she's having these heart problems. This heart condition impacted the family and it impacted the relationship because she was much weaker. She needed help with the children. So Joshua was staying at home more, helping to raise the kids. Family and friends had set up a GoFundMe page to help raise money to make up for the lost wages because of what was going on. So this gives you a sense of the problems in the marriage, in the family. This is a really stressful situation. Okay, so that's one part of it. So three years after Stacy's pacemaker is implanted, in September of 2018, 32-year-old Stacy Hunsucker dies of a heart attack. Nothing seems unusual there, right, Lance? If you have a history of heart major disease. heart attack, yeah, no. Okay, so so far everything's not looking too bizarre. It, it, it's one in one, but you know it'll add to three when you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> All right. Now, when Stacy dies of this heart attack, Stacy's mother becomes very suspicious of the circumstances and everything around it. And here are the things that do make it somewhat suspicious. Because the husband, right, Stacy's husband, Joshua, refuses to allow an autopsy. Absolutely says no aut autopsy. And within two days, she's cremated. And within a few days of that, he has filed claims on her two life insurance policies, which total $250,000. I don't know if there is anything necessarily weird about that. We don't know what the decedent's last wishes were. Maybe she didn't want to be buried. Maybe she knew the end was near and she wanted to be cremated. Exactly. Very possible, right? I think the one thing that probably set off Stacy's mother was that soon after her daughter was dead, that her former son-in-law all of a sudden had a girlfriend moving in. And so she suspected he had been having an affair. She was very suspicious that he was so eager and quick to collect on the life insurance policies. So Stacy's mother petitioned the state insurance department to start investigating potential fraud here. Now, there are some additional things, and these are just observations, and everything is perspective, right? So you have Stacy's family and friends saying, wait a minute, Joshua doesn't seem upset enough over the passing. You have some colleagues of Joshua, he's a paramedic, saying he doesn't seem upset enough about Stacy's passing. Okay, everybody grieves differently, right? The, those things are not um, criminal. I agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> you may be strange, may be bizarre, but if it's not criminal, it's not criminal. If there's so, one thing the world is, there's, there's a lot of strange. We're all strange now in different ways. Yes, we are. And this one in particular, this poor guy's got like a <laughs> dark cloud over him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's talk about how Stacy was found, because I think this is also important because it's, again, different versions. So Joshua said that he found Stacy, his wife, passed out, slumped over the side of the couch in their home. Mm -hmm. And then she was taken to the hospital. And that is where she died. Now, according to court records, he gave different versions of where he was right before finding her. He said that he had gone for a walk. He told someone else he was in the kitchen working on his computer. Do you find that at all strange that you don't know exactly where you were when your wife almost died and ultimately does die? Well, he could have been doing both things. He could have went for a walk and then went into the kitchen to fix his computer. And they're both, they're both not mutually exclusive. They both could be true. But, you know, if you ask me what did I do yesterday at three o'clock, I'm going to have to look at my calendar and get back to you with that. So the way our lives have been conditioned to be, we're always on the go. So sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint a certain time or location where we were, unless there's a big catalytic event that occurred. So definitely like your wife. wife would be that, you know, the right. death of your wife would probably be that. But then there's also studies that show that events like this can cause temporary lapse of memory, lapse of judgment. You know, I get it. It does sound pretty far-fetched that you didn't know where you were uh but it would make more sense if he said yeah i was walking uh taking a walk and then i went into the kitchen to work on a computer and then i saw my wife 
And if that way, so if I was a defense attorney, that's the way that I would phrase it. He didn't lie to either one of those two people. He told the truth to both of them. It's, it's just that he did both of those things before he found his wife uh, deceased. Do you find it also interesting the fact that he is a paramedic by trade and that what he does for a living at this point is instinctual to react, to save, to know and have the details? And here he's a little fuzzy on stuff. No, but I will say being a paramedic does not help if they're trying to prove that someone who put whatever they put in these eye drops caused the death. How would you have no to do that? I think that will be the issue, uh, the, the point that will be difficult for him to overcome. Okay. So Stacy ends up dying at the hospital, as I said. And here is where things are going to get um, very, very interesting. When, remember, we just said that Stacy's mother was very suspicious and she managed to convince the North Carolina Department of Insurance to begin an investigation to dig in deeper. So it turns out that the authorities uncover what they believe is foul play. But the question is, how did they figure out this alleged poisoning if we have no body? I mean, she's been cremated. There was no autopsy. Because at the time that Stacy was at the hospital, her wishes were to donate her organs. So there had been discussion about that. There had been some paperwork. And apparently there had been some blood and tissue samples, which had been taken from Stacy to make sure that she could be an organ donor. This is before they made the decision. There will be no donation. She's going to be cremated. There's not going to be an autopsy. So the Department of Insurance manages to find these vials of Stacy's blood and tissues and gets the report on what was in there. And this is when the revelation is made that there were very, very high levels of um, the eye drops, right? The, the like ridiculously high levels, yeah. like, like yeah. no one would have this much. According to the examination of her blood, it was described as abnormally high levels of a decongestant that is called tetrahydrazoline. Now, that's the stuff that's in eye drops that makes your eyes not red. It's also mm -hmm. the stuff that's in nose spray if you have a decongestant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could have that in your system. But she apparently, according to the prosecutor, had 30 to 40 times higher the therapeutic amount usually taken. So the state attorney... The state attorney, Jordan Green, said in court, that medicine has a dramatic effect on your heart and would cause heart stoppage or heart failure. And Stacy died of a heart attack. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this investigation is going on for almost a year. While this investigation is going on, something unbelievable happens, as if this is not unbelievable enough. Josh... Joshua continues to work as a paramedic, and <laughs> I don't even know how to describe <laughs> a fire on a helicopter while it's in the air. Okay, <laughs> right before he gets charged, he gets charged in December. So around Thanksgiving of 2019, Joshua nearly dies in a helicopter, a medical helicopter, because it catches fire and has to make an emergency landing in the parking lot of a car dealership in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. It was such a big deal. It made the news. I mean, there's video of the helicopter because you just don't oh, usually, right? That's a big deal. That's it's, a big deal. It is Even a big in deal. New York City, where we have a lot of news, that's a big deal. Exactly. So it makes the news. And then one month after that happens, he gets charged with Stacy's murder. So that to me, but nothing happens in the helicopter case. Like he, he survives, everybody on board survives. There are no patients on board. It's him and it's um, at least a chopper pilot and er everyone survives. Then he gets charged with Stacy's murder and he loses his job as a paramedic. And what's interesting, Lance, is, you know, you have one side of the family who's like, this guy wanted her dead and he wanted the money and he wanted to be with the other woman. And then on the other side in court, you have all of his family and friends saying, what are you talking about? What are you saying? There's no way he could have poisoned Stacy like this. So, so w what do you do with a case like this? 
you have to try it. You know, I, I, I can see this, uh, the both sides of the coin in, in a situation like this. You know, you stated earlier, people grieve differently. So it's hard for someone to say you're not crying enough or you're crying too much or you care too much or you don't care enough. That's a subjective thing that we all go through. Of course, they're going to use that in his trial to show, you know, in this year of guilt and he felt some sort of way and he planned this thing. But no one actually knows how that man felt. Maybe he grieves differently than you and I. Maybe he just he's an internally grieving guy that's not showing his emotions to others. I, you know, there are things that point finger at him that he may be the one that is responsible for a death. But there are a lot of things that need to be uh, to be questioned and answered. One, where did you get the eye drops from? Maybe the manufacturer just made a mistake and put out these eye drops. Are they looking for the batch that these eye drops came in to see if there are other people who have got any similar eye drops? And the just because the eye drops may have a higher dose of the chemicals that they normally should have, it may not cause the same reaction in someone who is not using uh, a pacemaker or right, whose body composition is different than the one of the deceased. So there's a lot of things that have to come into question motive. Okay, they're going to say the motive is that he was having an affair and the life insurance policy. But when did the life insurance policy get taken out? The life insurance policy was probably there for some time. He had a girlfriend. Okay, a lot of men cheat. You know, but just because you cheat don't mean you kill your wife or your girlfriend. You know, those two things don't add up, you know, together. Why now? What happened at this reason that made him uh, say, I am or not going to kill my wife? I guess a lot of it is going to come into his new girlfriend. Was there pressure from her that you have to leave your current, you know, relationship? And he didn't want to leave the relationship. And there was a back and forth struggle, which caused him to do this. He's a paramedic. He would know that by, you know, overdosing on these uh, eye drops, it would have a adverse effect with someone who was using a pacemaker, uh, maybe that's the reason the rush for cremation as opposed to letting the organs be used because he knew that the, the test would show that there was a higher concentration of these chemicals in her blood and someone with his type of experience would or should have known this and the, the finger would point at him. The whole helicopter situation, sort of probably like death by cop, you know, you like, you know that ball is about to drop. You know that those charges are coming. And, you know, a lot of times the police department will speak with counsel and say, look, I think we're going to have to charge a guy. We'll give you some time to get your affairs in order and we'll set up a surrender date for you to come in on this X, Y, and Z date. So you know that that's coming. And then, you know, once you're formally charged, you're going to lose your job. You're, you know, you're going to lose that $250,000 if it was gained, you know, illegally and through fraud. Uh, public opinion is going to be a, a very big thing for you. Maybe your goal is to just end it all at that point. So you think there's the possibility that because he's been charged with setting that fire intentionally, that you think there's the possibility that he did that to kill himself, that this is he was going to go out in a blaze of glory. Unless that's his thing, setting fires on, on helicopters. But I've never heard that from anyone. Like, what's the only reason you would set a fire on a helicopter? That's in the sky. Yes. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, I, but what frightens me about that is if he wanted to kill himself and he was so despondent, the problem is he was going to take at least one other person with him. And God only knows where that helicopter could have landed or exploded, killing countless, it could have landed yeah. on a freeway, a yeah. school. I mean, they're going to use that against him, too, because that's indicative of, of the praise and difference of human life. If, if you're going to kill yourself, kill your, yourself. You're going to kill all of these innocent people. And if you are the type of person that is, is capable of contemplating the death of other people because of a situation that you're going through, then you may be the type of person that's willing to kill your significant other. So, Lance, I'm curious. These two incidents are separate, but do you think that the helicopter fire, that those charges in that case will make its way into the murder trial, the, the trial? We're still waiting for the trial to start. There's no date quite yet. Do you think this is something that would be part of that? I think as a defense attorney, I would fight to finale to keep it out of that. Uh, I think the prosecution is going to fight to finale to keep it in. 
because it shows his state of mind and the type of, uh, you know, his motive and the type of person that he is. But I, I can, it, I guess the question is, is it more probative than prejudice? You know, is, is it overly prejudicial to the client by bringing that in? Because, uh, you know, would a reasonable juror infer that because he did the helicopter fire, then more likely than not, he probably, you know, did that as well. And he must be guilty and not listen to the evidence or the facts and be so hung up that what type of guy would set a fire on a helicopter, the type of guy that would kill his girl. Right. Right. His, his uh, wife. I'm sorry. His wife. Yes. His wife. Even so worse, his wife, his wife, the mother of his two kids. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, and so young, so young. A, it's a very it, the whole thing is very disturbing and it is very bizarre and and it's so tragic because you have this young young woman who's lost her life early she has young children um he's now facing a murder trial and then this charge for the setting the fire on the helicopter that's com even though he's out on bond he's still i mean he's got two children that he's got to worry about because the mother is dead i do have a suspicion though lance i started thinking about this because we've done a few other cases um on true crime daily about the poisoning of people with eye drops mm -hmm. and sometimes this poisoning can take place over a long period of time and causes all sorts of um other problems and and organ failures in addition to the heart condition and i started thinking wow did 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 the alleged poisoning begin late in life, meaning it was a short burst that happened late, close to when she had her mm -hmm. fatal heart attack? Or did this poisoning start years earlier when the heart started to fail and she needed to get the pacemaker? You know, probably. But if you're a paramedic, you have access to these type of drugs if you really wanted to poison someone, poison someone. And I mean, that's a lot of commitment, you know, so you're going to wait years for this thing to finally work. I mean, I don't know, people who, who want someone dead usually do their best to get them dead as soon as possible. And that is very logical. And that is why you're here, Lance, <laughs> because sometimes the law is just as simple as that, right? Yeah. The crime is as simple as no. that. I've seen, I, I, it, was, it was in Sixth Sense, uh, the movie where the mother was poisoning the daughter with the soup over a course of time. So, I mean, I've seen it in movies, but I'm not sure that that, that actually plays out. But I'm just saying stranger things have happened. It's true for stranger than fiction sometimes. Absolutely. And some people, you know, do want to harm people and keep them in this incapacitated state for a long time. But it sounds here if he had a girlfriend and there was a life insurance policy waiting and if if he is, and if he did do what it is that he is charged with, that it would seem that stretching that out would go against the goals the police say he had, which would be the right. money and the girl. And how do we know he gave her the eye drop? Bingo. Sure, yes, that's what's troubling yeah, me. Yes. Yeah, I mean, how are they going to prove sure it? DNA, and they have to swab the, the the eye drop bottle to see, you know, whose DNA is on it. Maybe there's some surveillance video in the hole. If you have a ring. Or, you know, some sort of surveillance video to show uh, who gave her the eye drops. But it would seem as though putting eye drops in is a regular course of action that you do maybe after you brush your teeth, before you go to sleep. You know, it's something that you give to yourself. Are you that incapacitated where someone has to give the eye drops to you? And or they put not, it in, or they put it in, we've seen where they've put the eye drops into the liquid. It's like, oh, I'll get you a cup of yeah. coffee you know, pour the pour the thing in. That's what we've seen in some other cases. Again, we don't really know. We don't have that information like we do with some other cases. So let's get back to um, the charges he's facing and yeah. where he is with all of this. So um, right before Christmas of 2019, which would have been a month after the helicopter, um, cra well, I guess emergency landed, uh, he was charged with the murder of his wife, he was freed on $1.5 million bond. So now we're going to fast forward to what's been going on uh, with the helicopter. So last week, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department say finally publicly 
and they charge Joshua. They say that he intentionally set the chopper on fire, that he allegedly torched a syringe pump while inside the chopper while it was flying over Charlotte. He has now been charged with felony burning of personal property. It's an interesting charge. The hospital is obviously very upset about this. They had already been investigating the emergency landing and the fire as they would have, but they've released a statement about this incident and the charges um, for that helicopter fire. Quote, if what Mr. Hunsucker is charged with is true, it is unfathomable, always hard for me to say, to <laughs> us that what what may have possessed him to endanger himself and others in such a way, we are extremely thankful that our pilot was able to land safely and that no one was injured, especially grateful that there were no patients on board. So he's now been released on an unsecured $50,000 bond and is due back in court on this charge in May of 18. Excuse me, May 18th, not May of 18. Of 2021, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. He's got a lot of problems. He's got a lot of problems and a lot of suspicion. Some bigger than others, though. You know, if, if this was me, look, I'll deal with that helicopter thing. You know, it, it's that murder <laughs> that I'd really be worried about. Absolutely. And we're going to watch that one. So before we move on to our next case, we have a quick word from our sponsor. When you're looking for a new home, you want to make sure that it meets your needs. Can you work in that office? Can your family cook together in that kitchen? You have to know that the house fits. And with Rocket Mortgage, you can make sure your financing works too. Rocket Mortgage builds a home loan experience designed for you with certainty at every step and no unwanted surprises. You can relax knowing you're getting a home loan that fits your life. Visit rocketmortgage.com slash true crime daily because when you need a mortgage that fits your life, Rocket can. Call for cost information and conditions, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. For our next case, we're going to move over to Florida, where a man is accused of shooting his girlfriend and then staging her death to look like a suicide. So here's what happened. Last week, police arrive at a Northport home, and they find Chelsea Nandor in bed. She's on her back with a gunshot wound to her left side of her head and a gun in her left hand. Chelsea still had a pulse. And authorities rushed her to Sarasota Memorial Hospital, where she ended up dying of her injuries. Chelsea is a mother of three, and she had been dating 38-year-old Clinton Pittman at the time of her death. It is Clinton, her boyfriend, who calls 911. And I always find 911 calls to be very revealing about a lot of things. Again, we all react differently in a panic situation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but sometimes the things are said or the way they're said make people scratch their head, right? It's like, yep, yep, really? Yep. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> so Clinton tells the 911 dispatcher that he had been outside in the backyard and, quote, heard the damn thing. Presumably, this would be the shot. <laughs> the, the gun. Yeah, 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 yeah. I heard the damn thing. Um, and then he ran inside to find his girlfriend with the gun in her hand. So he tells 911 she's bleeding all over the place. This is a nine-minute call. And and um, he's saying, you know, she has blood all over and the gun is pointing to her head. Okay, I guess that's a good detail. But nonetheless, I think I'd be focused on... Yeah, is she breathing? Is problematic. She... Yeah, yeah. What are you, is your radar? Yeah, your... yeah. You know, okay. So if the gun is still pointing at her head, one, this is what's going to happen. So the hand is going to jerk back, and the gun probably still wouldn't be pointed at her head. Two, I heard the damn thing. You know, that doesn't sound like the one that really cares that the person that they supposedly love, you know, just got shot. If you're talking, you know, like that this one really bothered me. You know, as a defense attorney, you're always looking for a way to defend someone. This one is a little bit more difficult than the other uh, because the first thing the police are going to do or should have done was take his clothing because when you shoot a gun, the gunpowder residue 
will go on the clothing of the person that shot the gun more times than not. So they would have gotten, if he has gunpowder residue on his clothing, then more likely than not, he's the one that fired the gun. If he wasn't in close proximity to her when the gun went off, if he says that he was outside when everything happened. And she's right-handed, right? And the gun was in her left hand. Yes. Hey, look, I, you know, I'm, I don't know this woman's strength. I like to think that I was, I'm pretty strong, but I, just, I can't do nothing with this left hand. So, I, you know, everything I do, I write in my hand. I, tr- I try to act like I can do things with my left hand, but I can't. It's the most difficult thing to do. It's weirdly enough, if you're, if you have a dominant hand, trying to do things with the less dominant hand, basic, simple things, is just really difficult to do. But you're going to pull a trigger from a gun with the other hand? Eh, Very unlikely. Very Mm -hmm. unlikely. I also, you know, this happens a lot in these cases, especially when it's this tricky thing. Is it murder? Is it suicide? Is everything that happens in those first few minutes and those first few hours when police arrive on a scene, what is done and isn't done has such bearings on the case and the evidence, because that's a great question. And we don't know the answer to whether his hands were backed, but they should have been right, because Mm -hmm. someone is dead. And it appears to be from a gunshot wound. And like you said, chances are his description versus what it looks like on the bed or what it looks like on the bed versus what it would in real life maybe aren't adding up, which would lead you to say, you know, it's just standard. We're going to just test your hands. Just going to make sure. Can we collect your clothing? That's, you know, because you have to treat everything. Yeah, no, no, but but this is an, Nothing's easy, but easy third one, I would say, than the previous case that we addressed because there's some really smart people out there. So they can tell by the way the exit wound the, the, the exit wound is, the position that the gun was in. So even if she was left-handed, you know, was it like this, like this? Was it like this? How did the bullet leave the, you know, the, the head if the bullet did, you know, exit the, the wound? Where is the most gunpowder residue on her head? Where, how was she laying down on the bed? Did she just lay down and shoot herself as she was laying down? Or was she sitting up in the bed, which caused her now to lay down after she got shot? And if that's the case, then the gun wouldn't be pointed to her head. You don't fall back like this. If anything, your hand goes numb and you fall back like that. I, I find it really difficult to believe that the person would shoot themselves with their less dominant hand and have the gun still pointing at their temple if that's, you know, what they're saying. Exactly. I I think it is very suspicious. Now, he allegedly struggled. Police say he struggled with answering some very basic questions, um, not just to them, but also to the dispatcher on the phone because he's repeatedly telling the 911 dispatcher, hurry, hurry, hurry. That's his thing. Hurry, hurry, hurry. So then... When the dispatcher says to him, okay, help me help her, we're going to do some life-saving techniques, we'll do what we can while paramedics are on on the way, he declines to provide any assistance. He just tells the dispatcher no. I mean, I'm saying that very politely. He, you know, declines. He's just like flat out no. He says, quote, ma'am, I can't touch her. Now, if this is your significant other and there's any chance of survival, why would you not touch well, her? I, I can see that, though. You know, you could be so distraught that the person that you love is laying there bleeding profusely from their head. And you're like, I, I, you know, you're in a state of shock yourself that you can't pull yourself to make physical contact with someone who may be deceased or who is dying who you love. But then the counter argument to that is, you know, let's say it was mouth to mouth. I can see someone having an issue putting their lips on a stranger's lips. But if this is the person that you've been with, I'm pretty sure you've kissed for a very long time uh, and many times. So I don't see what the issue would be here unless you were just so distraught to see them like this, you couldn't pull yourself to do that. But I think Darwin's theory of survival, if it just kicks in with, you know, you have to do whatever it takes to make sure you save that person's life if you care about them the way you say you do. The other thing is, I find it odd that he held the phone up so the dispatcher could hear her labored breathing. What was the point yeah, of why? this? Yeah, why? 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 Yeah. Yeah. 
Like, you want to talk to her? It's like, you want to talk to her? She's like, yeah. <laughs> I just, it does, it makes no sense. I'm just like, how is this helpful? Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I was in a video call and they on FaceTime. Look, you could see her right there, not breathing. I, on. it, it, that to me is very, very bizarre. Then, then he tells the dispatcher, he says, quote, Jesus Christ, this is freaking me out. Okay. That's probably accurate. It's freaking her out more. She's <laughs> laying there dying. Help her out. A absolutely. So NBC2 reports that during their investigation, authorities interviewed Clinton and at that point and her family and her friends. And that's when the authorities learn that she was indeed right handed and not left handed. So this is separate of how odd things may have looked at the scene. Now they have it's concrete. Proof. Odd. It's, it's, you know. It's. It, it, I'm trying to use a word that's not offensive to describe his actions because you would have known that she was right-handed. Like you didn't really think this went out through too much. You know, if, if this is really what you did and you're not, you're not um, passing a fake hundred dollar bill, you're committing the worst crime you could, you know, I think conceivably, you know, commit, at least it's up there, like the top three, you should have really thought this thing out a little bit more. A big thing would have been, is she right-handed or left-handed? Which gun am I going to put the, her hand in, the gun in? It's the same. Yes, definitely not very bright and not well planned out if indeed this this is a murder and not a suicide as it is looking. Authorities also recovered some surveillance footage that shows Clinton <laughs> leaving the home through the back door the night of Chelsea's death. Wait a minute. Allegedly throwing <laughs> a handgun into the woods and the gun was later that's it. Up. That's it right there. I think Done. that's the most damning thing right there, because that's you know, that's indicative of guilt to do something like that. If you didn't, if you had a less, all right, even if the gun was illegal, even if you had an illegal gun in your house that you used to shoot someone with, I don't know, five years ago. I'm I'm just going down the rabbit hole to think why would a reasonable person do something as not so smart as this? You have to believe that you look really super guilty if you're taking the weapon that was used to, you know, kill your significant other and hiding it somewhere that they're probably going to find anyway. Now you, now your prints are definitely on it and your DNA is definitely on it. And that's a bigger problem. And he was a convicted felon. So he was not supposed to have any guns. We, it doesn't done. Okay. Okay. See, there might be a defense in it. That may explain why he did what he did, because if he's in the felon in possession of a weapon, he's committing a crime. It's like, whoa, my girl, his friend kills herself. They're going to find the gun. I'm not supposed to have this gun. What am I going to do? And, and it could have been self-preservation, everything that he was doing. You know, there's an argument to be made that if he did not uh, pull the trigger, once the trigger was pulled, he went into Darwin mode to protect himself. And it was self-preservation so that, look. I'm going to get in trouble. They're going to think I did this and I'm not supposed to have a gun. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? I don't know. It's possible. Uh, it is, right? Anything is possible here. Reasonable doubt. That's all you need. Reasonable doubt. I don't think there's much here. <laughs> <laughs> in the other case, yes. In this one, I'm not so sure. <laughs> so at this point, investigators believe that Chelsea's death was not self-inflicted, that this was not a suicide. They absolutely believe, this is their theory, that Clinton shot her in the head before placing the gun in the wrong hand, in her non-dominant hand. Chelsea's family also has a little bit of insight. They say that Chelsea was getting ready to leave him. They were going to break up. Now, this could possibly be what was going on. It's always important to know what was going on in the lives of the people involved mm -hmm. before the crime occurred. Also, let's look back at, at Clinton's criminal issues. So he has convictions dating back to 2007 for crimes including drugs, making terroristic threats, aggravated assault, domestic violence. Now, this to me is the most interesting. According to the local NBC station, Clinton posted on his Facebook page a picture of a certificate which he earned for completing 20 sessions of a domestic violence intervention program in November of 2020. I say that Clinton did not do very well in class. 
Well, I mean, I mean, one, why would you post that for other people to see that you had to go for domestic violence training? That's just not the smart thing to do anyway. But guys like that, that are so dominant and abusive and that have to go through those type of training. You know, I don't, they usually, when they kill their significant others, they don't run from it or hide from it. They're just that arrogant and indignant and, and, and it's a power thing uh, with them. You know, this is a, a strange, you know, a strange situation, a strange case. It really is. And and it's a very fresh case. So there's a lot of detail that we don't have yet that we'll be waiting on all of the forensics that have not been released yet. So right now, Clinton faces charges of second degree murder, which is interesting, tampering with evidence and two counts of possession of a firearm as a felon. Why do you think they went for second degree? Intent is a hard thing to prove. You know, you you can it's easier to prove someone's actions. It's harder to prove why they did, you know, what they did. So for the levels of culpability, they have to, you know, prove what the attention for his actions were. And like you said, it's a really early case, but those charges either could go up or down as time progressed. In many, many, many cases that I've done, the charges start out like this. And I have to, you know, manage the expectations of my clients. Like it, it just looks like this now. They're going to supersede this indictment in a couple of months. Trust me, no, I've been doing this long enough. Trust me. And then they're doing their investigation. It's like you said, the case is fresh. So they're spending their time doing the investigation, see what laws are applicable that they can charge him with. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few months those charges range from the most serious to, you know, other charges that we don't know may not even exist yet. Absolutely. And while we don't believe he's had his first appearance or has entered a plea yet, he is, of course, presumed innocent, as yeah. with all our cases, always presumed innocent. We're going to follow this one as well, because I find this one really fascinating. Uh, maybe she was ambidextrous. Maybe he thought she was ambidextrous. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it is time for our comments section. These are the crime cases that you all are talking about on our social media. And here is Owen Michael, the keeper of our website and social media, to tell us what y'all are talking about. Hi, Hi, Owen. Hi, Anna. Hi, Lance. How are you guys doing? Hey, Owen. Good. How are you? Great. I've got uh, some fresh comments this week. As you guys know, we get comments across our social media platforms and on the truecrimedaily.com site. And of course, we read them all. A couple <laughs> stories uh, from Facebook uh, and comments this week. We've got two men attending a birthday party at a bar in Pocatello, Idaho last week, got into a disagreement and took their fight outside. Uh, one of the men got on top of the other in this bar fight and repeatedly punched him in the face. The other guy reached up and pulled him down and bit the fleshy part of the man's nose off of his face. He said he was in fear for his life. Yes. That. A bystander outside the bar found the nose and put it on ice so it could be reattached. So that was what a, a nice good guy. Samaritan. Yeah, nice uh, guy. amazing. I, like, I can't believe that I someone... someone did that for me if that happened. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just thinking if I'm uh, having a beer at the, at the bar, it's the least thing you, thing you could do. Yeah, make <laughs> just sure find my nose. Okay. Here's, right. here's your nose, sir. Yeah. So uh, David C. says, uh, so he won by a nose? Uh <laughs> Kalanga B says, I bet things escalated quickly and then took a nosedive. Ah. Mm. Okay. Sorry, I've got mm -hmm. one more. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris yep. P, the police asked eyewitnesses, but nobody knows what happened. Oh, uh, that's okay. a good one. I, a good one. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no more puns for he, you on I'm, that one. I bet he couldn't, he couldn't smell that coming. Ah, Lance yeah. had to. <laughs> I, I, I got to get a rim shot to, uh, going on this one. Uh, <laughs> we, of course, have uh, a Florida case this week. Compare yourselves. A Florida man was arrested Sunday after an ambulance he allegedly stole from a hospital became stuck across the street from a sheriff's substation. Uh, an ambulance crew was dropping off a patient inside Oak Hill Hospital in Brooksville, Florida on Sunday afternoon when someone jumped into the vehicle and drove it away. The ambulance got stuck in sand and mud next to a pond about 10 miles away. And the suspect got out and ran. He was arrested a few hundred feet away from our Hernando County Sheriff's substation down the street. So uh, bad luck for this guy. Um, for our, our YouTube viewers can see, but uh, for our listeners, the suspect, Trey Cornwell, has a giant lightning bolt tattooed across his face. They'll make of uh, his judgment what you will. 
Mm. Avel P says uh, he looks like he needs an ambulance himself. Um, <laughs> Juan C says he stole the ambulance probably to teach his tattoo artist a lesson. Uh, that could be, or uh, you know, some free publicity for that tattoo artist. Uh, who, who can say? Uh, Katrina B says, and this is the question of the week: What is with the sudden surge in ambulance thefts? Why is that a new trend? And uh, Katrina's cool. right. We, we've got uh, we had a, a two-hour ambulance chase in Dallas on Monday. Uh, we had an ambulance theft by a patient in Pennsylvania last week. Uh, an ambulance with a pregnant woman inside in Oklahoma. Oh, was oh no! Ago. That, yeah. yeah, that's crazy. And uh, three weeks ago, a man stole an ambulance in Kentucky and drove it to West Virginia. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on with this trend. Uh, I don't know if there's. I want to know about the last one. What, Kentucky what, to, to West Virginia. That's yeah, not a. Yeah. You know, that's a. That's a long chase. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, 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 Who knows? I mean, you know, people were apparently respecting the the rollers and the sirens and, and giving this guy space. Who can say? But uh, it does seem to be a trend, and uh, who knows whether uh, this will continue? But uh, of course, we will keep our eyes out for that one. Owen, as always. We thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's my pleasure. We'll see you guys next week. Yeah, see you next week. Thanks, Owen. That is our program for this week, Lance. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad that you said yes to us. I felt like I had to stalk you on Instagram to get you to say yes. <laughs> you had me at you had me at hello. <laughs> You're so funny. Well, Lance, where can people find you if they need a criminal defense attorney in New York or if they just want to follow you on social media? Sure. Uh, the firm is HamiltonClarkLLP.com. You know, we do criminal defense, white collar offense, complex civil cases. Uh, if you wanted to follow me on Instagram, it's Lance underscore ESQ, Lance Clark underscore ESQ. That's my professional page where you won't see me, you know, jumping off of boats and living some sort of a decent fun life. Oh, but that's my favorite page. That's the one. <laughs> no, are you kidding? I, I love I love your daughter. She's hilarious. She's she, so you know, she wanted to be on the show. She kept asking me, Daddy, can I be get, on the show, please? You know, I, a quick out. story about her. I did a uh, commencement speech for the class of 2020 and she keeps YouTubing the speech and she learned it and memorized it. So one day I walked into her room and she was reciting the speech that I gave to the 2020 class. And it was just the most cutest thing ever. Oh my God. Well, you tell your daughter, I love her because she is just, uh, her brain is so magical. There's that video you posted where she took a magic marker and she made these yes. stripes on her legs to yes, look like yes. a tiger. And you said, yes. what is this? And she yes. says, I'm a tiger. <laughs> I'm, a I'm a tiger. I was like, okay. I mean, what, what do you do with that? Oh, I'm a tiger. Okay. Y yes, you are. I thought it was so clever. And then she really got you where she took the Elmer. See, I've been watching. She took the Elmer's <laughs> glue stick and she put like Vaseline yes. in it and was made her own little yes. chapstick. And you think she's gluing her lips? Yes. I think that, you know, there was just a video of uh, a young woman that put Gorilla Glue in her hair. Yes. And I, and then this is right after, I'm like, what are you doing, little girl? What is wrong with you? She's like, it's a life hack, daddy. Excuse me? <laughs> But, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, you know, in tune with letting them grow and letting them speak their mind, letting them be themselves, especially little girls, you know. Lance, it has been such a pleasure. I hope you come Thank back. You. Say I hello will. to your daughter for me. Tell I her will. I think she's fabulous. Thank you so much. <laughs> and your I'm son gonna, is fabulous, too. <laughs> I'm going to wait till this I get this recording so I can show her. She's going to be so elated just to hear that. <laughs> OK, yeah, but you can't let her see the rest of it because this is a very, this is not good for kids. <laughs> we, You know, they... They help me with my cases. We talk about everything in life. You know, I got a guy that came down from the second circuit with 105 years. And, you know, I'm talking to my daughter about how I'm going to try to help him out. Say, like, Daddy, what happens if you don't help him? Like, he's going to die in jail. It's like, well, how, what can we do to help? So I'll just throw out my legal ideas to them. And, and she's only six, but she's able to grasp common sense things. And that's how you teach them young how to analytically think. And, you know, it's just, you can't go, I don't go into too much detail, especially with the offenses that involve minors oh, yeah. or mm -hmm. violence. Yeah. yeah. No, I get it. I, I really do. I get that. Well, th that'll be really fun. Um, you can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N, and you can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Of course, you can watch us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or subscribe to our newsletter, which Owen Michael puts together at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. Don't do crime.